Welcome to the Dirt on Growing, where we don't just plant seeds, we plant ideas that challenge the norm. I'm your host, Brandon Rust from Full Crop Sciences, and this is the podcast where living soil meets real science. From worm castings to bottled nutrients, microbial inoculants, and chemical pesticides, we're here to question the trends, break down the data, and empower your grow. It's time to think deeper and grow better. Today I wanted to talk about how to deliver calcium in mid to late flowering without dumping in a bunch of extra nitrogen or chloride or other ions that your plants don't use or don't need and without causing precipitation reactions that lock out nutrients. So calcium isn't just a veg nutrient, it is critical and needed in large quantities during all phases of growth including flowering. The challenge for hydroponic growers is that the bulk of their calcium comes from calcium nitrate and calcium nitrate brings in two very distinct things every time you use it, nitrogen and calcium. So mid flower a little extra nitrate might be okay but late flower that extra nitrogen can cause airy bud structures, delayed ripening, and decreased cannabinoid and terpene expression. So you have to ask yourself how do I keep enough calcium during flowering while I throttle back nitrogen and avoid unwanted nutrients and precipitation reaction. That's the problem that we're aiming to solve. But first, let's go over the main sources of calcium that are conventionally used in hydroponic fertilizer formulations. So calcium nitrate is usually the workhorse calcium source, but it's tied to nitrate. Calcium chloride provides calcium without the nitrate, but adds chloride. There are other sources that complex calcium, like calcium acetate, aminochelated calcium, humic and full calcium complexes. However, these are usually only used in synganic formulations. And to a lesser degree and not commonly used as is calcium thiosulfate. And finally, you have products that are generally used as media buffers like gypsum, limestone, calcium silica, but those are more for cocoa and peat based zones rather than tank mixes. So for mid flower you want to keep calcium high but start guiding nitrogen down. At this point the plant is still packing on biomass so you still want strong vegetative support and cell expansion but you're starting to lean harder into potassium while moving away from nitrogen. The strategy would be to keep calcium nitrate as your primary calcium source since it's still the cleanest and most efficient way to, to deliver calcium but to control nitrogen by reducing the rest of any of the other nutrient formulas that contain other forms of nitrogen like mono ammonium phosphate or potassium nitrate etc. This will start the downward trend in nitrogen usage. You really want to watch your calcium to potassium and calcium to magnesium ratios in mid to late flower also because it can be easy to antagonize and deliver calcium when using too much potassium or magnesium. So essentially for mid flowering you want to let calcium nitrate still do all heavy lifting but trim the nitrogen sources from any of the other inputs and make sure that you have a good proper calcium to potassium ratio. Now as we move into late flowering this is where things get a little bit tricky because we're looking for tight dense flowers We're looking for lower nitrogen levels and we're looking to decrease excess salts that might affect flavor, aroma, and quality. You still want enough calcium to maintain membrane integrity and prevent late life stage tissue collapse, but you don't want to keep pushing nitrate. So the question becomes, how do we taper that nitrogen without reducing calcium levels? And the trick is to bring in non-nitrate calcium sources. And this is where your secondary calcium tools come in hand. You have a few options and each has its own pros and cons. You have calcium chloride, which is highly soluble and delivers calcium without adding nitrate. However, it adds a lot of chloride. Too much chloride can stress the plant and cause a reduction in plant vigor. It can cause necrotic spotting and chloride has a negative impact with a lot of other nutrients. At 36% calcium and 63% chloride, the ratios can make it difficult to add at higher quantities needed for proper growth. Your other options are chelated or complexed calcium. An example of this would be something like 
calcium lignosulfate, which is an organically complex calcium fertilizer. It has better compatibility with phosphates and sulfates when tank mixed, but they have a tendency to be more likely to precipitate out of solution. You also have organic calcium salts. An example of this would be calcium acetate and calcium formate. These will bring in calcium plus organic acids that may have additional benefits on the system as a whole, and at reasonable doses, they won't spike EC the way that nitrates or chloride would do. They're particularly good in hybrid or bioactive systems where microbes can metabolize some of those organic acids. Then we also have calcium thiosulfate, which delivers calcium plus sulfur. And I haven't seen a lot of growers utilizing this input in hydroponics, but it could be a useful input to deliver both the calcium and additional sulfur, which can help with oil production. For cocoa and peat-based hydroponic systems, using slow-release calcium sources like gypsum, calcium silica, calcium phosphate, and bone meal can help supply calcium mid to late flowering, but it should be paired with a microbial input and started early in the cycle to give adequate time for the liberation of calcium ions from those inputs. So for late flowering, your playbook is to decrease your nitrogen while keeping your calcium consistent. And since we've gone over a little bit of these different sources of calcium that can be used, I want to talk a little bit about some of the basic principles you should understand about calcium and how it reacts with other nutrients. So a good general rule of thumb is to keep high concentrations of calcium away from phosphates and sulfates. They can create precipitation reactions and become unavailable. Calcium is more prone to precipitation reactions with phosphate and carbonates at higher pH ranges and higher concentrations. So just as a recap, when we're talking about calcium as a nutrient, you need high calcium levels throughout all phases of growth to maintain the highest levels of plant health and vigor. During mid-flowering, you want to start to trim nitrogen by reducing other nitrogen inputs first, and then use your potassium to drive flowering. You don't want to let potassium overcrowd calcium, so proper nutrient balance is essential. For late flowering, because you've reduced calcium nitrate, you can fill in some of that with small shots of calcium chloride, but you have to be aware of the negative impact of chloride on plant systems. But using chelated forms of calcium or by adding in slow-release calcium sources early, you can deliver calcium mid and late stage. What's going on, guys? I hope you guys enjoyed the pre-recorded video. This this podcast was really geared for the hydro and synganic guys. I know that I talk mostly about organic cultivation, and there's a large percentage of people that aren't strictly organic and that do use base salts. And so I figured I would address one of the biggest problems in hydroponics, which is essentially how to address mid and late flower uh, calcium without using something like calcium nitrate or calcium chloride and the problem is that the overall problem is that um, calcium uh, nitrate is usually your workhorse when it comes to calcium but you, you know you want to taper down on nitrogen so if you start to decrease that as you get into mid and late flowering or especially late flowering um you need to be able to continue uh, the calcium to add a different source. And so that's what I was really addressing in this video. And so if you're in a uh, cocoa, right, you have to remember cocoa is itself an organic substrate and doing things like gypsum, calcium silica, uh, bone meals, rock foss, uh, with microbes can actually help both buffer peach, but also provide additional calcium for that late, uh, for that mid and late stage, as you start decreasing the the calnit, and the and the biggest problem is that when you're looking at hydroponic nutrient formulations, again, it's usually calcium nitrate or calcium chloride de uh, derived calcium sources, um, and then you know, so being able to deliver those things, calcium thiosulfate is something that I don't see a lot of people using, but I think that might be an amendment that would be beneficial as well to deliver mid and late 
uh, flour, calcium. So you have to remember, calcium is a super important amendment and it's needed throughout all phases of growth. And it, unlike nitrogen, it stays consistent. Nitrogen, you know, it logarithmically increases with biomass increase and then decreases as it matures. So if you guys have any questions about uh, uh, mid and late state calcium delivery, Uh, just let me know, and we'll get to the Q&A section of this before we sign off. Do you top dress your calcil on cocoa? Correct. Yes. So that's what you would want to do. If you're using something like calcium silica, which is a really great amendment because, again, you can also get the benefits of the silica. There's a small amount of magnesium and iron. And it's going to buffer that media. The same thing with something like high calcium ag line. It is also going to do, uh, bring in things like calcium, magnesium. It's going to buffer media. The thing is that a lot of these are slow release, so you need to make sure you're getting them early, and you need to and you need to, and you should pair them to get the best efficiency with a microbial input to help solubilize that calcium. And then also, what that is going to do additionally is if you have a calcium, right? Because I said in the video. Calcium will precipitate with phosphates and sulfates very easily, especially if there's too much. So if calcium precipitates with a sulfate, it becomes gypsum, right? Gypsum can then be resolubilized through microbial action, right? Through um, my, uh, enzymes that are being produced by the microbes. And so if you're using them, if you're pairing it with a microbial enzyme, even if you do get precipitation reactions with those nutrients, they're going to resolubilize and become available again. Same thing with calcium and phosphate. If it, if it becomes calphos, right, it's unavailable to the plant, but those microorganisms will again liberate those things back together. So they'll, there'll be a cycle of precipitation and then liberating those. And then they'll be, you know, but the thing is, it's not just constant precipitation. That's what you would normally see. Um, with just basic uh, nutrient ions, if you're not using a microbial input, so it's those the, those microbes are not just helping with that, but any other types of precipitation reactions might be occurring. Um, nutrient incompatibility, you know, it's one of the reasons why you have batch tanks for certain, you know, A and B, or your mix it, your micros, and this and this, or whatever it is. You have different batch tanks because a lot of these chemical fertilizers they're not compatible. And when mixed together, they start to precipitate, you know. And so, you know, that can be a problem with calcium delivery is, right, if you create these precipitation reactions and you don't have the right conditions, that's why doing all the steps together and using things that work synergistically to get the maximum uh, efficiency out of the product. Here's another comment that says, you've had great results using slow nickels, three types of calcium. And, you know, when I'm building soil, there's there's a lot of different types of calcium. And there's calcium from calcium phosphate. There's calcium from bone meal. There's calcium from gypsum. There's calcium from uh, calcium silica. And so there's multiple types of calcium. But the anionic form of calcium, the way that it's it's liberated, uh, and, and the way in the form that it's taken up is the same. It's it's divalent, divalent form. Um, but I'm sure you said it needs to be dialed in. If you really want to dial it in, pair it up with a microbial a product, or try calcium silica because I'm telling you that the the solution grade calcil, along with a microbial input, it liberates that calcium, utilizes pH, but it's liberating silica, and that's going to inherently strengthen up your plant and create better defense you know it's going to upregulate some of those defense response through jasmonic acid and psilocylic acid signaling pathways is week six of flour too late to add some calcil no it's not especially if you're doing like a 10 week variety or something like that i typically am typically the stuff that i breed and grow is usually done between day 50 and day 60 right in there 
I don't like long flowering times and I don't breed for that. So I'm usually cutting things off around, uh, you know, week six, sometimes even a little bit sooner. But it really depends on the, you know, the flowering time or the, the time that that plant is going to be um, cultivated for. Mark Nelson, there's a guide. I just dropped a guide on horticulture oil on the um, IG. So if you comment, it'll give you that guide and you can read up all about the rate, proper ratios. So here's a good question. If I use the cow sill as a top dress with cocoa, should I still use the liquid sigh at the same rate as I do now? So I'm not sure if you're going to even need to use that because if you're getting in that calcium silica early, right, and you and you do it, you know, often you're doing one tablespoon per gallon of media every couple of weeks along with your microbial input, you're going to be constantly supplying that calcium and converting that silica. So you may not even need it, but I don't, I can't say that without data, like without testing the media and seeing exactly how much silica you're bringing in from the monosilicylic acid product versus the conversion of the silica into monosilicylic acid. But if you guys are interested, um, I will be doing a, another guide on, um, like calcium silica, or if you just access the drop box through IG, some of the IG automations or the menus over there, uh, even in the links in my bio there's a dropbox and there's a white paper on calcium silica and its use in pumpkins it was a really cool study where they showed that it had much higher levels of plant available silica it actually only can be in a total of uh, 100 ppm once it starts to polymerize in solution so it can't go over 100 ppm but what it was showing is that it was going to those levels. And it's a really cool paper. I mean, it's not obviously cannabis, it's on pumpkins, but a lot of the science still translates when we're looking at the dynamics of how these things are being used or how they're being converted in soil through uh, microbial metabolism and uh, mineral and, chemi and environmental weathering. Holy Toledo said he just got some of these. You know, Holy Toledo, if I'm not mistaken, your order went out today along with some some beans that you got one in the auctions. Well, that's, that about wraps it up for this podcast today. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Make sure that you tune in at the same time Tuesday at 5 p.m. next week. And we're going to be talking about front-loading calcium. And we're also going to be talking about how to provide late, uh, mid and late stage calcium in organic cultivation. So until next time, make sure you guys go to the website. If you guys enjoy the this content, the free guides and all that other stuff, the way that you guys can support is by going and getting those products, picking them up for yourself and using them. Dr. Bugby put out a paper about amending. I wonder if Dr. Bugby is watching my uh, educational videos or something because anyway, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm going to keep doing it. I'll see you guys next time.